Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our first online webinar hosted by the Center for Gender Equality and Leadership of the Mozebe Foundation. Um, we have a panel of experts that have joined us today for a very important topic, mental health and COVID-19, and I want to thank them. We all know that mental health is a very important subject, which unfortunately, even though it affects a third of our population, we still it's, it's, it's still very much stigmatized and we do not discuss mental health in the manner that we should. We are in the middle of COVID-19, which brings with it a lot of anxiety, a lot of isolation, a lot of depression, and people need to know how to deal with it and who to consult. We have put together a group of panelists, medical experts and psychologists who will discuss this important topic with us and give us guidance as to coping strategies and where to get treatment. During this era of COVID-19, my heart goes out to the frontline healthcare workers, the doctors, nurses, and all the staff that work in hospitals and treat patients with COVID-19 and some of them just treating medical patients in general. As a doctor, I look forward to this very rich discussion and I hope that our audience will find something to take away. Thank you and I will hand over to Dr. Stembile, who is our facilitator. Thank you very much, Dr. Precious, and welcome everyone to this uh, great conversation I think that we're going to be having today. I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers today. Uh, firstly, it's uh, Dr. D, who is a clinical psychologist uh, and an expert on all uh, matters of, of, of mental and sexual health, and who's been working uh, particularly uh, on mental health uh, interventions during this time of COVID-19. COVID uh, thank you, Dr. D, for joining us. Uh, the next person I'd like to introduce, and I'm going here by the, the way that your pictures are on my screen, uh, so the way that you're all tiled on my screen. Uh, the next person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Nondombego Bila, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria in the Department of Social Work and Criminology, and is a social worker who's worked uh, extensively on mental health issues in different communities around the country. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bila. Um, the next person who will be joining us is uh, Professor Zugiswa Zingela, who is the Associate Professor and Head of Department of Psychiatry at Walter Sisulu University and at Nelson Mandela Central Hospital, uh, somebody who's been working very closely with uh, healthcare professionals uh, during this time um, of the lockdown and the cri around the crisis of COVID-19. Thank you for joining us, Prof. The Next guest that we have is Dr. Jose Litlape, who is, uh, I'm sure, well known to, to many of you. He is the head of the Health Professional Health Practitioners Council of South Africa uh, and an ophthalmologist by training, but somebody who uh, works closely with um, healthcare professionals and particularly during this time and will be coming to speak to us and give us a health professional view uh, of the crisis. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Litlape. And thank you the for the invitation. Next person is uh, Ms. Cassie Chambers, who is uh, joining us from SADAG, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, uh, which has been kept very busy during this lockdown period and will be giving us a view uh, from her organization, uh, but also an on the ground view, really, of, of what is happening as far as mental health is concerned. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Great. So, you know, one of the things about this COVID-19 crisis, um, and COVID-19 is the disease caused by this new novel coronavirus, um, is that because of the novelty and the new nature of this virus, um, there's a whole lot of uncertainty um, surrounding this disease. People don't really know how it manifests over time. We're learning basically as we go along. Uh, and governments have had to uh, think of, come up with interventions um, as they go. 
uh, learning from the experience of others and um, from the from the expertise of an organization like the World Health Organization. But this general sense of anxiety, there's a great article in The Atlantic, uh, the American um, publication by um, their uh, science journalist, uh, Ed Young. And uh, Ed Young wrote an article last week entitled, Why the Coronavirus is So Confusing. And basically, you know, just pointing to how much dealing with this brand new disease is really making a whole lot of people struggle, including governments. And this period of uncertainty, uh, as all the psychologists here know, is really putting great strain on people's mental health. Um, so combined with whatever other mental health issues or pressures that people may have, they also now have this added uncertainty that comes from, from this new disease. And that's some of what we want to speak about today. So that people can know firstly uh, how to know that the pressures that they are facing um, are more serious than just a little bit of anxiety on a particular day. So how to be able to see mental health systems in themselves and in the symptoms in themselves and the people that they, they, they love and interact with but also um, to give us a bit of a sense of what services, uh, what organizations are out there that can assist people um, that are feeling um, mental health pressure um, and, and illness in this particular time. So uh, without um, further ado, I'm going to start by asking Prof. Zingela, please, how has uh, COVID-19 impacted on the mental health of our society, uh, particularly you know, one of the things that's been said is that this disease doesn't discriminate. It, it, it will attack anyone, doesn't matter from whatever uh, class background you're in, race, gender. Um, but uh, have you seen that as well in terms of the mental health effects uh, of COVID-19? Uh, how have you seen it manifest across different classes, races, genders? Okay, thank you so much, um, Zitembele, for that question. If one looks at um, the COVID-19 outbreak, one striking thing about it is that um, it's a pandemic that has had a very disruptive effect globally. And the effect has not just been on, um, you know, um, one aspect of um, the whole world, it's been across the board. So it affects us in terms of our health systems, it affects us in terms of our economy, it affects us in terms of our ability to move freely, affects us in terms of our ability to actually interact with each other as social beings. So it is then no wonder that the mental health effects are going to be so wide ranging. Um, and the other thing to take into consideration is during any average um, epidemic, uh, you will find that, um, especially if there's a lot of uncertainty associated with it, the natural reaction um, of people is through anxiety, panic, fear, depression. Those are actually all normal reactions in a situation like this to an abnormal situation. Because remember, this is not in the normal realm of our experiences. This is something that has confronted us suddenly and massively, which means it represents a huge point of change that all humanity has got to deal with at the moment. So I'm going to emphasize again that it is therefore a normal reaction through anxiety, panic, fear, depression, uncertainty. And um, all of that is actually as a result of an abnormal situation. Um, and the reason it's important for um, us to understand that this is actually uh, relatively normal in our you know, realm of experiences, so to speak, um, meaning how we are reacting is normal, is the fact that if we then do not recognize that, then we start to think that there's something inherently wrong with us. So I think that's the first step that we all need to accept. Our reactions are relatively normal, and therefore, when we react in this way, we need to accept there will be those of us whose um, reaction is actually going to be magnified to the point where it may then interfere with our usual day-to-day -day function. And that is at the point where we might say, okay, in this instance, we might actually need intervention from a mental health professional. But outside of that, 
the you know average person will then go through these feelings and despite these challenges you may find that the average person is still able to cope relatively okay and when we then come in as mental health professionals it's when we find that despite your usual coping mechanisms you are actually overwhelmed to the point where it affects your functionality so i think um you know i'm trying to basically inform people out there that if you react with these feelings, it is relatively normal. Do not be afraid and think that there's something inherently wrong with you. The only time you need to worry is if this becomes a daily um, occurrence that perseveres, despite you trying a number of coping strategies that have, have worked for you in the past. So that's just a, a summary, so to speak. And that's what we see on a daily basis. Excellent, thank you so much. And thank you for reassuring us that it is normal to be panicky, to be anxious, um, to be stressed out at this time. Because as you say, this is an abnormal situation that's affecting the whole world. And so it makes complete sense that we would be um, responding to this uh, with our, what do they call it from my biology classes, fight or flight uh, mechanism, um, our exactly. biological fight or flight mechanism would kick in. Um, exactly. And so that's, that's, that's good for people to know. Dr. Lidzapa, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, so Prof. Singel has spoken to us about the general public and how people generally uh, are responding to this, to this crisis and the kinds of feelings that they're feeling. But of course, with the people that you work with, with healthcare practitioners who are at the front line of trying to deal with this pandemic or preparing uh, the system to be able to deal with the pandemic, surely they must be facing di a different set of challenges at this time um, and, and feeling different mental health pressures, I think, or more acute mental health pressures I think to the rest of us um, and yeah so can you tell us a bit more about what the challenges are facing healthcare practitioners and perhaps what support structures there are available to them well there isn't much in terms of support structures and effectively uh, unfortunately healthcare professionals in general we have no solidarity amongst ourselves so everyone is on their own. And that's part of the problem. And we've actually moved away from our ethics. I mean, I'll give you a simple example that when I was raised, I was taught that as a doctor, you don't charge another doctor for healthcare services. That has disappeared. You go and see a colleague, you must make sure that your medical aid works. And if there's an outstanding amount or, or there's balance billing, your colleague will pursue you <laughs> for what you owe yeah. them. That's what we have become. So there's a various crisis in the profession. Mm. There's, there's an issue where everything has become about business. Medicine has become retail. And in terms of our ethics of putting our patients first, we have great difficulty doing that because we can't even put our colleagues first. We can't even put ourselves first. You know, our oath has reference to heal thyself first. Make sure that you are well so that you can take care of others. Mm -hmm. But it only sits in the document and we do not practice it. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the issue is what can society do to help us? In relation to COVID, it's fairly simple. When you get to hospital, we only support you. There's no cure. Mm -hmm. It's only supportive treatment. So you're not going to defeat COVID in the hospital. You're going to defeat COVID outside the hospital. And you know, when people say it's in your hands, they actually do not explain it. That it is in the hands of the public to stop the virus. It's not in the hands of healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. Now, when we say stay out, stay home, people need to understand that we defeat COVID by keeping the spread of infection. And it is kept out in the public with simple measures, washing your hands, social distancing, not passing it to somebody else, knowing that if you have symptoms of an infection, whether it's flu or it's diarrhea, seek help and get sorted out. But the key issue is everybody talks about PPE, personal protective equipment. But that is after the fact. 
That's when the healthcare professionals are protecting themselves in terms of dealing with a person that is COVID positive. But what is critical in dealing with COVID is po what I call POPE, P-O-P-E, which is protection of others' protective equipment. The cloth mask, the shield that you put on, that is far more important because if that works, there'll be a very small requirement for PPE. That's how the community can protect the healthcare workers. That's how we defeat this virus. That's how we protect our vulnerable system. You know, we all foaming on the mouth about lack of PPP, PPE, etc. We've seen health systems of extremely rich countries that are trillion dollar health systems not cope at the hospital level. There's no hospital that will have enough equipment if people get sick. Yeah. So the key is it's in the hands of the public. It's in the hands of everyone. And the key method is the motto should be how do I protect others from my cough or sneeze? Fantastic. And if all of us do that, we will overcome. So, you know, Prof, what, do you, Dr., what you're speaking about is this idea of solidarity, that actually the best way to protect ourselves in this disease is to adopt a view of social solidarity that we'll each do our part, play our part in curbing the spread of the disease so that we don't get to the point where we overwhelm um, our health systems and our healthcare professionals. Uh, Prof Singela, you were speaking a bit earlier about some of the work that you've done with healthcare uh, practitioners in the Eastern Cape to prepare them for, for the COVID crisis. Can you tell us a bit more about that, please? Yes, um, thank you so much, uh, Setembele, for that question. What we did is um, around the beginning of April, when we were starting to see an increase in the numbers uh, who were infected in South Africa, I noticed very prominent anxiety and fear and even panic among some of our um, health staff. And it quickly became very clear to me that if this is not addressed, we are going to have health staff who are probably the best trained people to deal with this, but it's gonna be difficult for them to actually come to work every day because of all of this fear. And therefore I sat and thought to myself, this should really be something we should be doing instead of waiting for mental distress to occur after um, and only acting after. So um, I then um, together with the rest of my team um, worked out a program based on um, I would say a model that has been used for psychological preparedness in disaster situations. Because in my mind, I actually equated this to a mass trauma or, or disaster. And um, having taken that decision, I was then able to find quite a few um, papers published on some work that had been done, for example, in um, Australia, preparing for extreme weather. And I then um, started adapting um, some of those ideas to fit what one would require if one is looking at a pandemic. Um, and using, you know, what some of our psychologists, um, you know, um, on the panel will understand, um, what uh, is cognitive behavioral therapy combined with, um, you know, one or two other types of therapy, I was able to borrow from those schools design a basic program that we can then deliver over the space of about um, um, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, and then um, to implement it. And since then, we've trained um, 330 um, healthcare workers since um, around the first week of April. And what we have managed to get as feedback has been amazing in terms of how overwhelmingly positive, um, you know, um, it's been reported to have um, you know, assist them, assisted them in terms of dealing with the enormity of Again. working under these conditions. And because of that, we are then expanding where we started doing this in Amtata. We are also doing it in Port Elizabeth. And tomorrow we've got a training session with facilitators in East London. So we're trying to make sure that as much as possible where we can assist, we reach as many uh, frontline healthcare workers as possible. And so far, feedback has been really positive. 
fabulous. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. And also that the the sort of the preemptive strike, so to speak, right? Uh, yeah. That before the crisis gets overwhelming, uh, to start equipping healthcare workers with the skills to be able to deal with the crisis when it arrives. Um, Ms. Chambers wanted to say something uh, in terms of the work that you are doing uh, as SADAG. Yes, I wanted to add, you know, from the discussion about the mental health of our frontline staff and healthcare workers, in South Africa, there weren't campaigns or programs before that really focused enough on the mental health of our doctors and healthcare workers before COVID-19. And I think one of the lessons that we've taken in South Africa's strategy and really addressing COVID-19 is that what we've seen overseas is that a lot of the doctors, the nurses, the frontline staff are really not coping on a mental health level. They're really anxious, they're stressed, they're burnt out. Um, very anxious and depressed, there's sleeping changes, all these different impacts on their mental health. And one of the things which is so great to hear what's happening in the Eastern Cape is really focusing on mental wellness and speaking to community yeah. healthcare yeah. workers who are on the front line and getting doctors and hearing about these initiatives are really fantastic for us to be proactive to look after the mental health of our doctors before there's a crisis. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. D, I'd like to turn to you because you've been working uh, quite extensively with some uh, mental health, um, with uh, healthcare professionals around preparing their mental health for this period, but also just generally in your clinical work. Uh, could you, you know, Prof. Singela started off uh, by telling us that, you know, our response of anxiety, of panic, of fear of depression is normal under the circumstances because we are in this completely abnormal situation. But certainly some people will fear that, you know, the feelings of distress that they uh, are going through right now aren't just normal stress, um, that they may be pointing to something more um, you know, pathological or something that more serious that needs to be dealt with. Um, what symptoms do you think people should be looking out for uh, as a signal that they should be reaching out for help uh, before things get any worse? First of all, I certainly would like to echo the response from the professor. I think it's very important to hear that these feelings of anxiety and sadness and fear generated from uncertainty are normal reactions to a very, very unusual and traumatic situation that is fraught with uncertainty. I also would like to add, you know, this whole thing that the virus doesn't discriminate and it doesn't, you know, everybody will, you know, talk about the fact that we're all in the same boat. I have a problem with that a little bit because I think that we are not all in the same boat. I think that we're all in the same storm. We are all in the same storm, but there are quite a lot of different boats. And so people who actually are worried about where their next meal is coming from, or who are living under very difficult conditions with a large number of people in a very tiny environment, you know, or who, these kind of external um, uh, situations can also add to some of the expected feelings that are generated from being you know, in this crisis. Certainly for everybody, when you have to worry, I think there are two things that have really been uh, highlighted. It's duration and extent, how bad and how long. And do you have any coping mechanisms to deal with it? So the first thing in these kind of, uh, in recognizing these feelings is actually in the recognizing them. You know, you know that you feel your, your behavior is, um, is unusual behavior. Physiologically, you can't sleep. There are appetite um, problems. There are um, shortness of tempers. There's frustrated behavior. There's intolerance. Sometimes we talk about the fact that the situation actually magnifies. It's like an incubator for what might have been going on before. So if you had a tendency to be somewhat anxious or a tendency to go to, to be sad or be depressed, often these kind of things are magnified. Relationship issues are magnified. So if you're in a relationship that really is inherently really difficult with any fear of emotional or physical abuse, and you under lockdown in these situations, 
a lot of that can be like put in the frying pan and perpetuate it. If, and so many of the things that people are going through before, maybe that they've been able to not address and deny and say it's not too bad, it'll be better in the morning, it's just a stage that I'm going through, they often feel that there's kind of no place to hide internally or in terms of their relationships. So the first thing, as I said, is to recognize it. And we say it's a bit of a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. If you name it, you can tame it. If you feel it, you can heal it. So it's the leaning in, which is counterintuitive. Most especially, I might say, for doctors. Doctors don't give themselves permission often to say, listen, I'm allowed to be a very experienced and accomplished doctor, but still a member of the human race at the same time. And I'm scared. I'm not sure if my experience has prepared me for this. I am sad about what I can see around me. There's shame that's on top of the feeling. So it's the feeling and then it's a double whammy of feeling ashamed about the feelings that you're having. So it's the feelings and the shame. And so being able to name it and name it sometimes even you have to stop and sometimes name it in the moment because somebody spoke earlier about fight or flight. Those feelings are generated from the primitive part of the brain, from the, we call it the reptilian brain or from the amygdala. And if you don't name it, what happens is that you can get emotional or amygdala hijacked. So in other words, you start reacting instead of responding. These feelings can overwhelm you and you can start catastrophizing. What if this, and when you do that, what happens is that you're unable to focus properly, to prioritize, to make important decisions and to think, which you can do if you stop and recognize the feelings and go more into the adult part of your brain which is the neocortex of the brain. So that's just the first stage. And there are a few others after naming the feelings yes. that help, like self-compassion and getting a great support system or two. Yes, thank I, you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so basically, so, would, so the advice if I, that, you, that you're giving in terms of being able to recognize, well, actually, this goes just beyond, this now is going beyond the normal uh, anxiety, is that feeling of overwhelm, that when you're overwhelmed by these feelings now, and you are unable to, um, to cope with the normal uh, stresses of, of, of the day or to function, uh, properly, then that should give you a hint that this is, uh, that these, these feelings are going, are, are a bit worse than, than, than usual. Absolutely. Sure. And, and being able to name what those feelings are, um, and being able to give yourself compassion around them is a good first step at being able to deal with it. Absolutely. This is, um, this is, uh, th that's, that's, that's great. I just want to, um, then move to, Dr. D, you've started already giving us some of the kind of coping strategies uh, that one can start to use uh, when one feels so overwhelmed by feelings of anxiety, of stress, uh, of fear, and starts, I love that word, catastrophizing um, in, 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 that, in that period. Um, so Dr. Bila, can you give about the different coping strategy, strategies, uh, basically for people who are to deal with this, with this crisis and trying to deal with all of these manifestations? Here and in time. Thanks, Doctor. What I can talk to is the issue of being resilient. Resilience for me is very, very critical. Just to be able to adapt to the situation that we are in, and also the issue of being mindful of the situation that we are in. For me, that is very, very key. The other important aspect is to take control because now most of the people, as we can indicate, 
colleagues, everyone is indicating that the fear of the unknown. We don't know what is happening around us. So what is very, very important is to take control. I'll cite an example. Let's say if you are taking treatment, you need to continue taking your treatment. If uh, you have a routine, you need to take that into cognizance. There should be that routine. Making that, maintaining that schedule is very, very critical. So that, that is very, very important. And also the issue of, you know, some things that are minute because most of us were working from home and people sometimes they will feel that I don't want even to wake up. We need to maintain that wake up, take a bath, eat, exercises are very, very critical for this time as well. So another input, I think we, I was hearing Dr. Zindi talking about also the doctors, they are misinformed. It's very, very critical to unplug sometime from all this information and try to engage in some positive issues or activities, something that will make you feel at least happy, something uh, that will make you uh, at least forget about what is happening just to unplug because the information if it's overload it's creating a challenge in us so that's what is very very critical the other issue is to stay busy i'm encouraging the community to stay busy we mustn't feel i ah, know it's time now let me just chill let's continue let's have some plans in place if i'm going back to work okay i can do this better okay my studies I at hold now, what can I do best then so that I can be a better person? So doing something positive, I talk to that, positive thoughts are very, very critical. And also maintaining a sense of hope, uh, South Africans, that is very, very critical for us, just to maintain that sense of hope. Because now uh, many people are feeling uh, so hopeless and then we, we can't make sense of what is happening around us. The other important aspect is to seek help. When we feel that we're well, and all my colleagues have cited that, I'm just talking about there are many people that are frustrated now, where am I going to get food? You know, something basic. There are many people that are so anxious, they are so frustrated about that. Where am I going to get employment? You know, because I don't know what is going to happen to me. So what I'm saying, let's take care of ourselves. Let's uh, seek help wherever that we can. And also our spiritual being, that is very, very, that moral compass that we have. We have our different moral compass that we need just to activate. That's something that is very, very important. Another thing that I want to emphasize is to take advantage of the telehealth services that are there for us. I'm sure other colleagues will talk about all those resources. I believe that there are resources that are there that they can help us. So basically, that's what I can say for, for the strategies. Okay, can Thank I speak you. to the Thank issue you so much. Of, there's uh, so much. Yes, please. Yeah, there's the issue about resilience yes, Dr. That, that everybody's talking mm -hmm. about. And, and this God complex of healthcare practitioners. And, 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 and we, we need to be able to deal with that uh, problem. Well, all of us need to understand that you can't live as an island, but we need to be allowed to be vulnerable, but we need to have spaces to go for assistance. And those spaces are not there. And I think sometimes we get treated like we are indestructible and we get destroyed in the process. If you look at the Minister of Labor announcing protections for workers and saying that any employer that does not provide personal protective equipment for the workers will be prosecuted. For healthcare workers in the front line, nobody is affording them that protection to say your employer has to protect you. Mm -hmm. And if they do not protect you, they will be taken to task. Mm -hmm. So you got to go out and strike for yeah. PPE. Yeah. instead of it being embedded. So, so there's this issue where we've neglected ourselves to where we don't matter to ourselves and frankly, we're not taken seriously by anybody else. Mm -hmm. If you go back into the fact that uh, historical issues, magistrates can negotiate for their salaries separately, but healthcare professionals don't have a separate chamber to sit 
and negotiate with government? Are we that important to the people of South Africa? Because we're not being taken seriously. Your own circumstances are not being taken seriously. You, you look elsewhere where there's been COVID. There have been benefits that have been accruing to healthcare professionals. You know, tax breaks for the extra hours that you're going to be doing. None of that is coming through. And, and this business of clapping hands and, and standing on balconies when people are dying on the front line is not really showing appreciation to the frontline healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. So th th that is why it is important that healthcare professionals begin to take themselves seriously for others mm -hmm. to take them seriously. Yeah, may I just say something about that? Because I'm so pleased that you ended with that, uh, doctor, because it is the healthcare professionals who have to give themselves permission for all of these very, very tough challenges that they're going through. They are driven by purpose. And they, they talk, I've spoken to some who say that when they go through the doors of the hospital, they see the fear in their colleagues' eyes. And they're going to go up there and to do it anyway. Contrary to some of the pre-COVID experience, which you highlighted before, I have found that they are turning to each other as their tribe. They're kind of talking about their tribe and, and saying that this shared emotional event of knowing that the, the experience that the other is going through is in a sense giving them permission for that vulnerability and to kind of find platforms, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, but to kind of, um, unpack and de-stress a little bit through conversation at the end. It's been interesting that some of the healthcare workers have said that they would have usually turned to a family member or a partner, a beloved partner, some of them still very much still are, but they say that they are, they've got their own issues dealing with a number of children under lockdown or whatever. They, and, and they are, seem to me, one of the things that nothing is joining this community more than the shared emotional event and the, the openness and more vulnerability of saying, listen, I don't know what kind of day you have, but I know what kind of day I have. And I yes. need that kind of virtual hug from another doctor, maybe not only from a person, to offer me that kind of encouragement that says, okay, we're going back in tomorrow. And yes. to do what you are saying, if they value themselves to the extent that you say, and we value them to the extent that this applause can be translated into practical help, that has to be seen practically in ways that you're talking about. With the, all of the assistance, the hours, the tax breaks, the protective clothing and so on. But for the emotional sustenance, to understand that they often can't even live at home, they have to step in for families of dying people when the families can't be there, which is an added role that they're not used to before. And they're dealing with all of this kind of uncertainty. And some of them are saying, actually, you know, Dr. D, no one is recognizing that more than my yeah. colleagues are. So just the same as that there are these preventive, pla preventive platforms we might need some kind of structure ongoing or post-COVID because they haven't got time for mourning. They're not going to go through the mourning cycle. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the possibility of post-traumatic stress disorder manifesting like they did with troops in the front lines, we can't just forget about that possibility yes. and offering some kind of support and help to prevent that post-traumatic stress even long after this is over because they can't stop and mourn there's the next one and the next one and the next one that they have to attend to. Definitely. Thanks. So this is that's a that's a big thing to be to be to be aware of is the the post traumatic stress uh, that will that will come from this. Um, I see uh, Prof Singela, you've got something to say. Dr. Bila, did you want to add as well? 
Um, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, um, Let me take Thank you yet. so much. Thanks, Timberley. I just wanted to touch on two things. Um, something that has already been touched on by oh, Dr. Letlape and oh, Dr. D as well. In the training that we do, the last few minutes of our training actually focuses on self-care and team care. We tend to take the groups that come in as teams as far as possible, so that when they come in, they already have an understanding that I'm not in this alone. I'm in this with my team member on the right, on the left, in front of me. And what has been very useful about that is the feedback we've received is that since um, we started this training, some of the people or team leaders who are running the teams have come back to us and said, ever since uh, their groups have attended, there's better team cooperation and the team morale has actually improved, which goes back to the point um, that was being made before, is instead of going in this as isolated doctors or healthcare workers, when we focus on team care and self-care, we find that there's a sort of camaraderie that binds everybody together. And together, they actually are stronger than trying to do this in isolation. So that has been very useful. That's fantastic. So that idea of being able to support each other is really is really important here and re for, for for healthcare workers. There was a question being asked in the Q and A uh, by uh, Tiri Gule um, that was asking about what would be an effective way to address the mental health needs of mental medical professionals um, in light of the acknowledgement that COVID nineteen will remain prevalent for months to come and no real programs have been put in place to support medical personnel and what both uh, Prof uh, and, and Dr. D are saying uh, is, I think, an answer to that question uh, about the kind of teamwork um, and group care. I think that's important. But also what Dr. Lizabe has said, that we also need practical, there's material assistance that is needed. Mm. So you know, financial support to doctors, um, but also other material support uh, from the state to doctors um, that can that can help them cushion uh, their their situation right now. But Ms. Chambers posted an answer to that question about a collaboration, uh, a multidisciplinary partnership between psychiatrists and psychologists uh, through mm -hmm. the COVID care network. Ms. Chambers, would you tell us a bit more about it, please? Yes, I think one of the, the great things that have come out of COVID-19 and there's a way to be proactive and again, hearing all the stuff that is happening is really promising and gives us hope that we're trying to tackle this um, and to try to provide support. So one of the initiatives that have come out is this collaboration between the Medical Association, SASOP, the Psychiatry Association, SISA, who looks after all the psychologists, SASA, which is um, linked to anaesthetists as well as SADAG, is coming together as this collaborative approach to provide all healthcare workers, whether you're a nurse, you're a community healthcare worker, you're a field worker who's helping with the screening, all of these support networks, the people working on the front line from beginning to end, that their mental health is also taken seriously. So through this COVID care network, and I uploaded the link there, it's this collaboration where we've had in each province a group of psychologists and psychiatrists, various mental health professionals who've come forward and volunteered their services to help frontline staff. And they can register, they can access these services. And some of the things that we're looking to build capacity in, it's like the, the doctor said, is providing practical resources. So people can access it, whether they want to email anonymously, because again, there's a lot of shame and stigma with doctors and healthcare workers coming forward to ask for help whether they want to email and say, I need help, can I get debriefing? Or whether they want to call a helpline, whether they want to SMS, whatever platform, but just to ensure that they are actually reaching out for help is really important. So that's one of the collaborations that is coming out of COVID-19 and so many more of this has to happen. I think, you know, where SADA comes from is we see often in mental health, all the treatments and, and projects are often in silos where everything is happening separately, even across professions, across organizations. And something that has come out of COVID-19 is these collaborations, where you've got private government all working together to really try to provo you know, provide support. And I think those are the kind of initiatives that we have to raise awareness about and let people know on the ground how to access these services before there's a crisis. We also have to remember that our healthcare workers and our frontline staff who are also working every single day and have been for the last five weeks, if not more, 
if they're not doing well, if they get sick, whether it be because of a virus or yeah. other illness or their mental health, they're not able to help more people. So if we don't look after them now, we could have a serious crisis that we're not going to have enough healthcare professionals to look after when the wave does hit us. And I think it's one of the, the priorities that we have to raise awareness that all of these frontline staff need to look after their wellness today and now. And there were talks about resilience and training. That is where we're kind of buying time with this lockdown to deal with, with the wave once it hits. That's fantastic. Thank you. And one of the things that you've done is you've answered a question that was being asked by uh, Goodman Svego from UCT uh, about uh, the non-specialist workers who are tasked with field testing. So there's a whole lot of community health workers that the government has deployed to do field, to do screening and to do that kind of work in their communities who are dealing with their own anxiety, but also of the communities that they're working with. So it's good to hear that uh, an initiative um, like um, the, uh, let me get the name, the COVID care network is also looking after the needs of those people, which I think is, is really essential and important. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bila, did you want to add something to, to the conversation? Oh, I'm fine. I'm covered now. Oh, okay. No, that's excellent. Thank uh, uh, you. Dr. The one thing that I wanted, that I wanted to, for the panel to consider is the fact that one of the unfortunate things is that the coping mechanisms of most South Africans have been taken away. You know, South Africans cope with stress by going to the bar, going to the stadium, or going to the church, or to the mosque. And all those things have been taken away in yeah. times of COVID. And, and, and so the issue of the mental anguish is much broader than just the issues that we're looking at. So the COVID impact is not just on a medical basis. It's also mm -hmm. much more a spiritual disconnection, a mental disconnection. And it's far more profound than we begin to realize. Mm -hmm. But having said that, it's also given South Africans an opportunity that doesn't exist. We're very busy. We never reflect. We never take time off. So it's also in an ironical manner, you know, giving people an opportunity to say, my coping mechanism was uh, drinking with the guys or going to church and singing my lungs out. What do I do now? Uh, was it an appropriate, yeah. was it just a coping mechanism? This is my reality. Can I develop other skills that will help me that are probably much more reliable going forward that could be ta I could tap onto in my solitude. So there's an opportunity for, for, for us to emerge better from this, but we must not be unmindful of the, the huge stresses that people are under and the fact that their normal convenient coping mechanisms are not readily accessible. Mm. Thank you. That's actually a very important point yes, that Dr. Yes, Elizabeth yes. has come up with. Yeah. Um, and what I like about it is that it mm -hmm. recognizes the social being of our humanity. Um, and I think um, it, it's one thing to, to yeah. actually uh, remember, which is very important, is that even if we are not within the same physical space, we are lucky enough that in 2020, there are other ways that we can connect as human beings. Um, I mean, imagine if this had happened back in 1918 when we didn't have access to technology. We wouldn't even be able to have this conversation we're having. So for those who are lucky enough to have um, access to data, um, then even though it is a challenge, it still is a means of remaining in contact. And if one then looks at the, um, you know, um, effects that could come from not being in, a, you know, physical close contact, 
we're looking at isolation. We're looking at that lack of physical warmth that you feel when you get a, a hug, a, you know, or a reassuring tap on your shoulder. We're looking at so many other possibilities. And yet, despite that, we have found some ways of trying to make up um, for that, which is why it is always important to consider when people are talking about social distancing, um, you know, some proponents have said, don't call it social distancing call it physical distancing so that people can understand that there is no need to isolate yourself socially as well, just because you are not seeing each other, you know, face to face. Um, and I think therefore it's going to be very, very important for us to learn to do things in new ways because we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. So rather than relying on being face to face with your preacher in front of you, you may actually need to learn that at this particular time, I need to log on to this link and then I will still get to see my preacher and, and a few other congregants online. If um, in addition of us attending a funeral as 150 people, then we have to get used to the idea that Yes, we may not be able to be there, but we might be able to click on the link to see what happened during the funeral or to actually do it live. So we need to use technology at our fingertips to try and reach out as much as possible and to make sure that even if we're not seeing each other face to face per se, we still don't lose that human connection because that human con connection is actually what keeps our hope alive and what keeps us going on a daily basis. Absolutely. And um, I just think that we've just got to understand that there's sometimes a thin line between numbing ourselves and developing coping strategies. You know, so, um, somebody said to me the other day, it was quite a nice analogy. It's like all our pacifiers have been taken out of our mouth. <laughs> you know, we we're talking about, we kind of can pacify ourselves by going to, the bar or by joining with our friends or by rah rawing on the sports field or by sharing a movie. Some of it is also coping. They're not all unhealthy ways of coping. It doesn't all mean denial. I think some of that is, is coping and some of it is numbing. So we don't have that. And so just listening to the prop, we can look at what we do have. And I think the Chinese certainly weren't stupid when they use the same symbol for crisis as opportunity. And some of the things that have just been so highlighted is that people say that there's been a priority shift. They're kind of saying, you know, what used to be so important to me now is not central stage so much, unless, of course, you're talking about survival. And unless the two things, safety and survival, are, are paramount. But if you've got that, there's a different kind of priority shift, which is usually focusing on the importance of relationships and people who might have been there all the time, but you took for granted. And sometimes an overwhelming sense of gratitude where you look around you at members of your family with just renewed love and appreciation for these people and the fact that they are well and sometimes with you. We always think of the people who aren't with us. And the whole thing, you know, the different thing of just reevaluating what is and what's not in our control. When the world pulls a rug from under your feet, you kind of say, oh, well, the future is now. It's not one day when anymore. It's not a rehearsal. Where am I going? Where have I been? How do I want to spend my energy from now on? What's important to me? Some people are using it as that Thanks, time. Thanks, Dr. Dee. Self-reflection. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Very important time of self-reflection. I wanted to pull up two questions here um, that have been asked uh, by, uh, by the different participants. Uh, the one question is on entrepreneurs, that entrepreneurs have been deeply negatively affected by the lockdown. Uh, are there any source resources? Uh, that entrepreneurs and small businesses can access uh, for their mental health support from a business lens? Uh, is there any kind of access uh, like that? And then also somebody here was asking um, about uh, what are the resources that are available to those who don't have the financial resources to go to a psychologist or to a psychiatrist? Uh, can we give them any advice about the resources uh, that are available to them? Uh, Ms. Chambers, do you want to take those questions? Yes, thank you. And I think it also just reminds us 
on on the ground practical levels what people are dealing with on a daily basis and how before COVID even just accessing mental health services is difficult and a lot of people don't know where to go or who to speak to and as Dr. Zangela said already the system is already full it's already under strain with people accessing help and I don't want to deter people because it's so important if you're not coping and if you have any symptoms of mental health depression anxiety trauma or you're feeling suicidal it's so important especially during COVID-19 to access this help and there's different resources. Um, our clinics and hospitals are still providing mental health services. You're still able to see a social worker, a psychologist, to see a doctor, get assessed, even see a psychiatrist. You're still able to get your medication if you are already receiving treatment. And I think often people don't know where to go to access help. They don't know who to speak to or what the process is. And that's another role where SADA could even come in and just explain where to go, who to speak to. Um, and I think that just helps to allay some of the anxiety, especially during COVID-19, where we're a little bit more aware of social distancing, contact, going into places where they're treating sick patients. Um, so there are so many resources that are available for free, provided by the state to communities. And there's also a lot of organizations that do amazing work. There's there's FAMSA, there's Lifeline, there's SADAG, there's the SA Federation for Mental Health. And there are a lot of organizations providing this help during COVID and beyond. And I think it's just about encouraging and giving people the tools of how to access that help, even when they don't have any resources or they don't know where to go. You can start somewhere. Can I speak to the issue of uh, the resources? Me. Thank you. Uh, part, part, part of the issue yes. is we, we I've been speaking to my counterparts, the head of nursing council, pharmacy council, allied uh, health professions council, dental technicians, and traditional healers. And we've seen the need to raise funds for frontline healthcare workers from themselves and from others, so that those that need funding for activities that needs to happen. But there are other broader issues that need to be dealt with. If I give you an example, the doctors came to me worried about the issue of litigation in times of COVID. If they are now going to have to help and not practice within their scope of being a specialist, how are they protected? And the issue of litigation is something that gives a practitioner sleepless nights. You don't want to be sued. I mean, to be a gynecologist, you need a million rands uh, of insurance before you could practice. So there are many other factors that create, that are on the minds of practitioners that need to be dealt with, but we need to deal with them as a collective on a systemic basis. There are issues that have an impact on an individual, but cannot be sorted by the efforts of an individual or by a therapist. You know, when you're scared of being sued, you need a systemic solution to that problem that, would, that might require a legislative framework. So hopefully uh, we'll be in touch uh, and, and this is, won't just be a talk shop that we support each other and create that framework to, for all frontline workers. And also just to say to people, I may speak here and talk about a doctor, but I'm talking about all frontline health workers. And the biggest contingent of healthcare professionals and those that are negatively impacted are our nurses. They are critical yeah. in terms of this battle of COVID and they are the ones that are vulnerable. You know, they work late, there's a curfew at seven, they use public transport, no, arrange, no special arrangements are being made for them. No issues of accommodation next to where you work if we're going to be working huge hours. There's no talk about mobilizing the hotels that are sometimes around the health hey. facility to use them as places that where are empty right professionals now. that are empty right now, where healthcare professionals can rest. So you don't have to do the commute uh, you know, and, and be back early on early transport to come back. So there are many issues that we need to be able to engage with to deal with the state of mind of healthcare, uh, frontline healthcare workers. And lastly, I think to what Dorian was saying, People have to understand that post-COVID, it's not about a reset button. It's not about 
when do we get back to normal? It has to be a complete change. So we can't go back to a default setting. We got to reset the factory setting in terms of what we've learned from COVID. It can't be business as usual. Teleconsultation and telehealth will be a part of how we do business. But most importantly, prevention has to be key in the health system. We can't be working on a curative basis. If you look at even now on mental health, we're looking at you know, how to prevent mental breakdown, but we need to go to how to deal with the issues that produce the mental breakdown so that we are able to really be preventative. And, and, and more importantly, uh, our system has to change from a curative focus to a focus on well-being and health of the population. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Prof. Singela, before you, you, you step in, I'd like to ask a question that was asked earlier, um, somebody that sent a pre-question um, to, oh. to the organizers. Um, so the first question was, uh, please, can you explain what the distinction is between an anxiety attack, a panic attack, overthinking or being overwhelmed? So how do you, you know the different gradations of those? Um, what's the difference between just being normally stressed or being depressed? Um, and how does, the, how does all of this um, relate to lack of sleep um, and insomnia? And then one, another specific question, and I'm going to direct this directly to you, uh, Prof. Um, Zingela is about um, a question that says, you know, considering that group therapy is one of the successful interventions carried out by uh, professionals in mental health institutions, and people can't meet as groups currently, um, what um, is the advice uh, that you as a panel would give uh, for, for mental health institutions uh, to be able to continue assisting people? Okay, thanks for that, um, Tembile. We're gonna start with the first question. Um, I think it goes back to the point I made earlier that anxiety is actually relatively normal. It's adaptive as long as it is not overwhelming. So if you feel a sense of anxiety and it spurs you into action that helps you cope, that is not abnormal at all. Um, that is actually how one can tell the difference. So I feel a sense of anxiety about my upcoming exams. It pushes me to study. I study, I pass. That's still normal. It becomes abnormal when it paralyzes you. So in that fight, fright, or flight reaction, if you add an additional F, and that is freeze. So instead of spurring you into action, it results in you feeling paralyzed and helpless and not being able to do anything to help yourself. So if you now take that into practical terms, when it comes to dealing or coping with the current outbreak, for example, if it gets you to a point where you are able to actually say, I'm anxious about how I'm going to survive, therefore I should look at things within my control, which will help me survive. That includes, if I have money, I can get more soap. If I have money, I can actually make sure that all my family have masks. If I don't have money, maybe I can ask a neighbor or somebody around me who has access to resources. That's still the type of anxiety that you're using to help you cope. If on the other hand, your feelings of anxiety or thoughts about, or, you know, um, uh, fearful um, consequences um, are such that you are rendered helpless to the point where you don't know where to start, you don't know where to stop, and you don't know what to put together to represent a plan, then that is when we consider it abnormal. Because in that instance, anxiety has overwhelmed your thinking processes so much that you are actually not able to work out a plan or an action. So I think, um, you know, the explanation I'm giving here is actually meant for the average person in the street to understand. Um, anxiety by itself, there's nothing wrong with it as long as it's not overwhelming. When it's overwhelming, you will know because you won't know what to do. In addition, it then goes with physical symptoms. That would be shortness of breath, a heartbeat, feeling hot, not really being able to think properly, dizziness or an uncomfortable um, feeling in your stomach, you know, a lump in your throat, shakiness, all of that then says you are busy having 
what is referred to in layman terms as an anxiety attack, but is actually a panic attack. Typically, it lasts for about five to 10 minutes and then it goes away. And when it then keeps recurring, um, then we actually call it a disorder or panic disorder. So I'm not sure if that, you know, covers. That helps um, a great that deal. Thank you. And then I and think the second the one. Yeah. Yes. I think the second one quickly was to say, what's the difference between um, just being stressed and being depressed? And again, what you're looking at is how long those feelings last. If they're there most of the day, every day, for a period of more than 10 days to two weeks, then you know I'm actually going into a um, you know, a, a depressive episode versus it's like that today, but tomorrow you feel better. You can do something to get yourself out of it, which then means, yes, you were low, but you actually were able to cope with it. Now, when it comes to groups, if you remember, I had said that we are already running training and in, in the training that we're doing, we're actually doing it in groups, but it's small groups. So if you look at the regulations, it allows us to actually run it in groups of about eight we then have a big enough venue where people can social distance and we make sure that there is sanitizer, there's soap, there's water, and everybody who attends wears a mask. By doing that, then you're actually still able to run groups, but within the regulations and being mindful of not acting as a source of infection. So that's also doable. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I would like this, you know, a lot of the questions uh, I think uh, have been answered in the course uh, of the discussion uh, by the, by the, by the different um, participants and our different experts. Um, I'd just like to highlight uh, a point here from Numfundo Mukhati at the Center for the, Study, for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation. Uh, she's put over there her email address, nmukhati at csd. .za. It's in the chat for anyone who's looking for it. Um, and she's leading a, an initiative by the um, African uh, Venture Philanthropist Association, I think that's what they're called, um, who are working on an initiative on COVID-19. Uh, and she'll also be able to assist about uh, the different initiatives that are there and the mental health professionals that they're working with that are willing to assist people. I'd now like to just ask each of our speakers to give us just a, a word in closing about you know, where to from here? What can we expect uh, for mental health in the country um, uh, post uh, COVID? Uh, how can mental health services be ready uh, for the aftermath of COVID-19? We've spoken about post-traumatic stress. Somebody in the chat um, in the question said that, you know, it's the elephant in the room, it's the PTSD um, that, uh, that healthcare professionals deal with on an ordinary basis anyway, and even more so um, right now. Um, so where can you guys, um, can you guys just give us uh, your thoughts uh, about what comes uh, after this? Thank you. Uh, let's start with Dr. D. You're still muted. Hi. Okay. I think just to, to um, just wave a little red flag, I think there's a difference between staying po being positive, being positive that we hear at the end of every email or WhatsApp and being mindfully optimistic. Sometimes being positive means don't talk like that. You're not allowed to feel your fear. You know, it's fine. It's all be okay. Sometimes it's interpreted as denial of a reality of what people are going through. And I think they have to face it. Being mindfully optimistic means looking at the facts as we've been speaking about, looking at the strengths that you've mobilized before in lots of other situations, counting on the support that you've got, and really knowing it might be different to what we've seen before, but this too definitely will pass. It's going to pass, and I think that that is a reality, and that um, we might be able to use some of the lessons that we have learned, or we will be, to looking after each other and letting mental health take the position of concern and prevention that it really deserves, because we have just seen it come to the fore now, and I think that we shouldn't lose the lesson.
you Dr. are Bile, on. You're, oh, I'm now on mute. Dr. Right. Bila, your final. Thank you, Dr. D. That was really great. Thank you. Dr. Bila, your final words, please. Thank you so much. What I can say, as Dr. D was saying, it's also my words that we need definitely to be mindful of what is happening around us. And also the issue of collaboration, working together so that we can see that we conquer. Because really at the end, uh, we're going to meet uh, many challenges, but we need just to work collaboratively so that at the end we can conquer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that. Dr. Lissabe, please. You've uh, given us a lot of information about programs and things that need to be done concretely. <laughs> uh, well, for me, firstly, to be thankful that I am the only male on the panel with Madiba <laughs> on my shoulder. Uh, to say thank you for that. <laughs> and that, uh, secondly, never waste a crisis. Uh, you have a crisis my personal belief is that you come out stronger as long as you focus on the right things. It be, it's, it's an opportunity for us to reboot. And if you focus on what you can do for other people, you're going to come out better in this crisis. Uh, do not use a crisis to wallow on self-pity. Do a crisis to say maybe it's a wake-up call of how much more I can do to serve humanity. And lastly, uh, we will be coming to the foundation. I've spoken uh, to uh, Mayor Precious Mutsipe that we will be, we are starting care of the carers by the carers. And Fantastic. we will be linking up with all of you that have been on this panel, in particular SADEC and the other programs that you have, we will be bringing and the practitioners must save themselves. I believe in the airline motto of put the mask on yourself first and then you can save others. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Chambers, would you like to follow up with that about uh, the work that you do? So firstly, I'm really, I'm always really excited and encouraged by these conversations because during a time like this, mental health and talking about it is so important and to put it on the forefront these conversations should have been happening for a long time. But again, using the doctor's opportunity is to use this time very carefully and focusing on mental health for everyone. We've never as a country come through such a crisis, a, a global pandemic, um, we're all affected. Whether you have a mental health issue or not, everyone is affected, everyone feels some kind of stress. And I think it's so important that we start to take on these tips and tools and coping skills during this time either for ourselves or someone that we know of. And I think it's, it's about putting these programs in place that's not just for COVID-19, but it's for beyond. It's really making mental health matter. And I think my challenge to everyone um, is to not let the conversation end. You know, I think having a webinar series with over 60, 80, 90 people to be part of this and to be more aware, I think is fantastic more of these ways of connecting and like Dr. Zangela said, is like finding creative ways of connecting and communicating with others and making this conversation carry on where mental health is important, whether it's for yourself or to someone else that you know, but to reach out for help. I have posted contact details, but there are amazing organizations that you can reach out to that are doing great work. It's just about sharing it and letting people know that there is help. There is always help. Fantastic. And we'll share, make sure that we share all of those details on all of our social media platforms uh, and all the other ways that we can communicate with you. Thank you for that. And Prof. Singela, from you, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to the Mutsipa Foundation and Dr. Precious for organizing this and to yourself, September, for being such a beautiful facilitator. Um, and then to all the panelists, um, I would like to echo some of Casey's words in saying, now that the conversation has started, it is crucial for us to continue with this conversation. What I like about the approach we've taken is when mental health has literally been put under the table as something you sort of hide and only go to when you're really desperate, what we're now starting to realize is mental health 
um, is crucial to everybody's daily lives. In order for you to be able to cope, you've got to be mentally healthy because if you're not mentally healthy, then you start off with a disadvantage. And what is important for us to remember is as a nation, we are resourceful. As the, the, the citizens of the world, we're actually resourceful. And as much as this represents a huge challenge, we do have the resources to actually meet it and to actually overcome. So what is important for us to remember is as much as we started this conversation today, we need to also acknowledge that mental health has been severely under-resourced for many years in this country. And looking at the aftermath of COVID, we've got to also accept that if we continue to under-resource mental health and mental health services, we are a nation that's actually going to um, uh, literally um, be missing out on an opportunity to actually cope better than of what our um, abilities um, would seem like if we do not invest enough, enough in mental health. So we need to invest in mental health enough so that when the COVID is gone, we can deal with the aftermath without having to start from scratch. So to all the professionals out there who are busy in this um, line of work, uh, all I can say is please continue doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. And Ms. Chambers has given a great uh, end point. There is no health without mental health. Uh, and I think that this uh, conversation definitely proved that. Dr. Precious, would you like to have the last word, please? Oh, you Can muted. you unmute yourself? Can you unmute, please? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So just to say thank you very much to my amazing panel. It's, um, I mean, it's the public's amazing panel. And Dr. Stambula, I think you did, you did a brilliant job. I really thank all of you for your inputs and your insights and to the public for joining and sending all those questions. Thank you very much. We know that mental health affects every one of us and I'm glad that we can get on panels like this and speak freely. Um, what I wanted to say is that um, we're gonna be having other series. This is our first one. Our focus has been on um, healthcare workers, uh, as well as uh, the, the public in general, but focusing largely on healthcare workers. We're gonna have another one that focuses on students. We know our university students and students in general are also in limbo. We're going to also have another one that focuses on uh, people in the workplace, employers and employees, and the situations um, that we're finding ourselves in. So I think this has been a very useful discussion. And yes, definitely, we're going to be supporting the work that uh, Dr. Bitlape spoke about, as well as uh, Sadak, you, you, you do amazing work, and we're going to be supporting you. Lastly, I'd like you to give our healthcare workers a round of applause virtually, please. <laughs> thank you, everyone, and thank you to the staff at the Motepe Foundation for a fantastic webinar. And we look forward, we will have more information on the next webinars uh, where you can join us, give us your comments, tell us how we can improve and um, any ideas that you may have. Keep well and keep safe. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs> keep well. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.